Okay, you're welcome, Mark. This is week six of our series with Paul Rouse. He is a professor at UCD School of History. He is the author of Sport and Ireland, a History. We are continuing our look at the history of sport in Ireland predominantly and a little bit beyond as well. You can find all of these podcasts in the OTB highlights section. And as of this week, I'm told, it will have its own podcast category all on its own. If you search Paul Rouse's History of Sport or OffTheBall.com, you'll find it there. You can go back and listen to the previous few weeks. So, Paul, week six. Hello. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm very well. So this week we are jumping into, I suppose, a key component of Irish culture, Irish community, certainly Irish sport, obviously. Even during these very strange times, we have seen the community power of the GAA in a massive way. Yes, you, you look around Irish life. Uh, obviously it's sporting life, but way beyond its social, it's sporting life. And you look at the general social, cultural, political, economic imprint of the GEA. And it is difficult to imagine Irish life as currently constructed without, without the GEA, without its reach, without its meaning for the lives of, of so many people across, across the island. And it's, it's something that need not have happened. It may not have happened. We like to think of it as a natural offshoot of Irish identity, Irish character. But this organization was constructed at a very particular moment in time. And there was nothing inevitable about that construction. Insofar as anything can be said to be inevitable in history, there certainly was nothing inevitable mm. about the construction of the GEA. And more than just its construction, also the shape of that construction, the idea that it should be a multi-sports organization. If you look at its competitor organizations, they are single sport organizations, essentially, and the GA is different. Is there anything comparable to it? And by that, I mean the amateur ethos, the sense that you represent your home place, and also its popularity linked in with that, that you can have 80,000 people scrambling to get into Crow Park for all Ireland final day. Is there anything across the globe which has that sense of the local and, I guess, the national pull as well, and the amateur ethos? There are bits and pieces of similarities in various organizations around the world, but there is nothing that puts it together in the same manner that the GEA does. This, this capacity to be both a broad-based community sport, uh, sports organization, and number two, a community organization in and of itself, and number three, um, a sporting organization which bears all or almost all the trappings of what we would consider top-level elite sport. Mm. It's amazing, really, isn't it? It is. It's an, extraordinary, it's an extraordinary phenomenon, which is a product of the peculiar circumstances of Irish history, Irish geography, and the presence of Ireland within the sports revolution that reshaped British life and the life of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, as it was in the 1880s. Mm. And all of those things operating together, created by very, very peculiar and i don't mean peculiar just in the odd sense but very very particular people also at a very at, at, a, at a very particular time mm. in history in response to a very particular um set of circumstances i know from our previous week so where we kind of left things off last week we had talked about the 19th century in a bit of depth the industrial revolution the incredible urbanization which had happened around that time sports clubs are springing up all over the place so a revolution in many ways is happening and soccer and rugby is starting to trickle over into Ireland. So that is kind of the broad context. Everybody knows Hayes' Hotel. Everybody knows 1884. 1st of November, it was a Saturday. It was three o'clock in the billiards room. So will we, is that the best place to start here or do you want to paint a bit more context? It's as good a place to start uh, as, as, as Danny. And I think what matters about Hayes' um, Hotel is first of all that it took place at all. The choice of Hayes' Hotel it was related to the train lines, the fact that it was a central point in Munster where the sporting revolution had taken place. Michael Cusick, the key founder of the Gaelic Athletic Association with Morris Davin, had deemed that Dublin was gone to the English, essentially, and there was no point in attempting to drive an Irish sporting revolution from Dublin. So he, would, he, would, uh, he, he picked, he picked um, Turles as a starting point. Now, We'll come back to, to the idea of Dublin and, and the Gaelic Athletic Association because it was essential to the creation of modern hurling, the making of modern hurling, and it was in Dublin 
that the association found huge support in the beginning. But in that billiard room in Hayes' Hotel at 3 p.m. on Saturday, the 1st of November, were a group of seven men. Now, there is an argument, which we won't get into now, that there may have been up to 14 and possibly even 15 people there. And if you read club histories from around the country, you would swear like it's, it's kind of, they would have needed an annex on the hotel to cope with the number of people who claimed to be at that meeting. Yeah. But there were most likely seven uh, people in that room. The meeting is kind of establishing the precinct for GEA time at the beginning. It was meant to start at 2 p.m. It only started at 3 p.m. Cusick had circularized a whole load of people and invited them to the meeting. They'd sent it to the newspapers, invited all and sundry to come. And the fact that there were seven people in that room that we know for sure that were there um, was an appalling turnout. And it did not speak well for the future of the association. And the two people who drove that meeting were, were Michael Cusick and Morris Davin. Okay, so sorry to interrupt, because I just assumed those seven people, it was a select chosen group, very special people, but actually they were hoping for more. There was a brilliant part in the reports of the meeting, some of which were written by Cusick. Uh, others were written by uh, two other journalists who attended the meeting. John McKay, who was working for the Cork Examiner at the time, and John Wise Power, who were, was writing for the Leinster Leader. And they both mentioned the fact that Michael Cusick, in the course of opening the meeting, read 60 letters from other people who said they'd love to be there, but they couldn't make it. It must be great fun listening to him reading out all 60 letters. But it's this idea, this association, it, 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 it was a really poor turnout when you look at the caliber of the individuals and their status of people who, who were who 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 were organizing it and it did not augur well for its future okay so when you talk there about the caliber of people the likes of a michael cusack were they known nationally were they captains of industry coming together and various uh, people that would have been known and respected or were they unknowns so the two main people in the meeting were michael cusack and morris davin we'll come back to them in a second but the first place to start, I think, is with the other five people who were there, who were rarely mentioned as having been at the meeting. Um, so Joseph Ryan was a solicitor in Callan. He came to the meeting, never again appears to have attended any other GA event and emigrated to Canada where he died. Um, the next person was J.K. Bracken, who was a, an IRB man, a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, an organisation given to the liberation of, of Ireland from British rule by, by physical means, if, if, if necessary. And he was also a, a sports person, and it's one of those arguments. Was the GEA set up for political reasons or, or for, um, for, for sporting reasons? And uh, J.K. Bracken founded a club in, in, um, in Templemore, and J.K. Bracken's club won the first ever Tipperary Championship and proceeded to the All-Ireland semi-final. And in that semi-final, they were playing Limerick commercials and the game was in its latter stages. And at that stage, if you scored a goal, it was worth more than any number of points. And late in the game, Limerick commercials had split the defence open. Wait, what? This is like Quidditch. They, they were just true. They're going to score and, and Limerick commercials are going to be true to the All-Ireland final. If and you, Bracken, if you, if you Bracken score, appeared out of nowhere. If you score a goal, it beats all the other points. Every point. You could score 20 points and the opposition score a goal, you're done. Literally which led, from Harry Potter, Paul. Which, 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 led, which, led to, um, which, which led, of course, to people packing the defence if they scored a goal early on. We celebrated stories of that from all Ireland finals of the period and it meant they had to change the rules. But commercials are true. They're going to score and Bracken appears out of nowhere and just executes this extraordinary tackle. Um, on a player now the, 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 the tackle has always been difficult to define in Gaelic football but he, he basically milled the Limerick commercials forward and what made the tackle all the more spectacular was that uh, Bracken was actually an umpire at the match hmm. so the question you ask about somebody like Bracken is was he in it for the politics or was he in it for the sport and such was his sporting commitment it's very difficult to separate out the two another IRB man who was at the meeting was John McKay uh, sorry, it was uh, um, John Wise Power, who was uh, later to become a secretary of the GEA. And he was a journalist at the time in around the Midlands. And John McKay was a really, really a Belfast man living in Cork, really interested in sport and lived down there. The final person of the five, not central to the organisation, was really interesting, uh, St. George McCarthy. He was a policeman for in based down in Tipperary and it was often speculated he was there to spy on these Republicans who were setting up a sporting organization. But he wasn't. It would appear that he was there because he had been in Cusick's school in Dublin 
and he was a friend of Cusick's and he came to offer him support. He never again attended another GA event until 50 years later. He went to the All-Ireland Hurling Final in 1934, that uh, the, the whatever um, jubilee or whatever, whatever you call that. Um, so he went to that final in, in, in 1934, which leads you back uh, with Cusick and Davin, the two central driving forces. And if we start with Cusick, Michael mm. Cusick was born uh, in the middle of the famine in 1847 in County Clare into a um, genuine poverty, really difficult circumstances. He went to national school in the area and he was clearly a very bright child. And in one of these things that history does not record how this happened, but he was identified by somebody who helped him progress into a teacher training program. And it was utterly transformative to Cusick's life and to the life of Ireland. It is a reminder of just how much a life can be transformed by access to education. So he went to be a a teacher trainer, trainer in Dublin and in the Enniscorthy Model School. And then he went back down to near Gort, where he was a principal of a school by his early 20s, until late in his 20s. Michael Cusick is a restless soul. And he took up a job take, teaching in St. Coleman's in Newry. And he moved from there to teach in the French College of Black Rock, which was later known as Black Rock College. And he taught at Kilkenny College. And um, he taught at Clongos Wood. So he taught around the elite public schools of Dublin having come from a national school. And in all of those schools, he kind of, he was, he, he did multiple subjects. He was a brilliant mathematician to the point that where in 1877, he set up his own school in Dublin. And what that school was, was a grinds academy preparing people to um, uh, take the examinations to get into the English civil service, the British civil service, the civil service of the empire, or to do police exams and so on. And he made himself a lot of money in the 1870s and all the way along this journey he was playing sport so what were the sports he was playing well he joined the trinity college rowing club in the middle of the 1870s he is in the black rock college accounts books as buying a pair of cricket pants in 1875 he was competing in the athletics world of dublin which was famed for flying union jacks and having marching bands and having the lord lieutenant there at the scene and then in 1877, after he um, founded his school, he established a rugby club in that school, which he played for. This was the time when students played with teachers. He played the Cusick, Cusick's Academy 15. Mm. And he, he talked about, wrote about himself in the papers as being a sterling lover of, of the game of rugby. And then he took a newspaper column. He was a brilliant writer. I wrote about a huge range of different things from mathematics to how to do balloon tricks to, to sport. And as late as 1882, Michael Cusick was calling for the establishment of a cricket club in every parish in Ireland. He said boys should go to bed every night across the winter, dreaming of hitting the six and being the honour of hitting a six and being the honour of their parish, and so on. So as late as that time, he was he was embedded in these ideas of 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 a sporting world which was entwined with ideas of Britishness. That's not to say he accepted Britishness. I just say that he was he was part of that British sporting yes. world in Dublin. It was possible to do both, to play cricket yes. and to be a fan yes, of Irish nationality. I didn't realise he was so brilliant. Oh, he's, he's an incredible man. You read his journalism now. He, he had a newspaper column from the early 1880s, which, and he later founded his own newspaper in, later in, the 18, in 1887. And all the while, until his death, and he died really young, he was 59 when he died um, in 1902 or 1905. I can't have to check that exact mm. date, but he... he um, he was writing in the newspapers until until he died. And he wrote about Russian and French literature. He had an incredible turn of phrase. Later, he was at a, a hurling match and he, he, he wrote about the spirit of Tolstoy being no more refreshed than a journey across the plains of Russia than a, a, a true born Irishman at the site of a, a real hurling match. That it's like a city on fire with the, the cracking of the timber and the hissing of the flames burning into a roar of conflagration. So there's all of these. He, he just had a beautiful turn, uh, turn of phrase. Um, incredibly smart man, a genius, but also a peculiar genius. There is almost nobody in his world that Cusick did not fall out with in the Dublin sporting circles. He, he was utterly born to serve on a one-man committee. In, in how he, he ran things. Right, fascinating. 
So Morris Davin, then you mentioned, was the other driving figure. We all know the Davin stand. Yeah, Davin met Cusick for the first time in 1875 at uh, an inter- the first ever international athletics competition, which was between Ireland and England, and it was staged at Lansdowne Road. And Davin was the preeminent athlete of, of that generation. He, he only took to athletics at 29. Before that, um, he'd been born in the fa- during the years of the family as well. He was slightly older than Cusick, but born in the 1840s. But he was born to middle-class prosperity on a large-ish farm um, down, near, um, down near Carrick uh, on shore in Tipperary. As well as having a farm, his family had a river haulage business. So they used to, to, they used to run teams of horses and pull barges between Clonmel and, Clonmel and Carrick pulled the goods back and forward. His father died when he was 18 and Davin took control of the, the family farm. And Davin was absolutely the opposite of Cusick in terms of personality. So Cusick was rash, impulsive, fighting with everybody. Davin was studious, organized, subscribed to encyclopedias, kept a record of, of everything, had learned how to play the violin, um, studied amateur boxing. And when he took to athletics at 29, he had already won a series of regattas on the coastal lines and, and on river towns all around the south east of Ireland in a boat that he had built himself. This is the type of man that, uh, that he was. But he took to athletics at 29. He subscribed to newspapers and other encyclopedias to look at training things. And in, in the, on his farm, he constructed a gymnasium for himself in the 1870s. So you can still see the, dumb, the dumbbells are still kept down there, the weights are, on the Walsh's farm near Carrick and later actually he built a pitch it's like if you build it they will come type thing he built a pitch on his farm for two All-Ireland finals but they could Kenny actually won their first All-Ireland hurling final on the pitches uh, beside Davin's house which staged all, All-Ireland finals but Davin Davin was utterly meticulous he kept a diary which is in the Croke Park uh, Museum of the training that he did he ran 10 Irish championships in a row uh, in weight throwing events, that was his. That was his skill. He won two English three A's championships, which were the equivalent of world championships at this period. He was considered the best all around athlete, uh, essentially the best all around athlete in the world. And there's a brilliant letter that he got from uh, English athletes who asked, "Was he intending to come over to compete in this year's championship? Because if they were, they weren't going to bother training. He was just he was that formidable. And his two brothers, Tom and Pat, were also outstanding." Uh, athletes, um, Pat, Tom was a brother who almost got away. He didn't do quite as much training as the other two. Pat brought the world high jump record in Monster Evan uh, in 1882. So these were incredibly talented people. And Morris mm. was the driving force, the great celebrated Irish athlete of the late 1870s and early 1880s. Wow. Very impressive. So not just a couple of lads who said, let's get together and form our own association. They thought deeply about things very clearly. Smart, brilliant men. You said that Davin and Cusack first met in 1875. So we're nine years shy of Hayes' Hotel in 1884. Were they firm friends across those nine years? How did they decide to come together and form this association? What's the backdrop? What's their thinking? This is a really tangled story. And so the short version of it is that they weren't close friends. They had their life, they did their things. Um, but by the early 1880s, the Irish athletic scene, which had promised so much in the 1870s, was beginning to drift into a couple of problems. First of all, there was no governing body had been set up to organize standards of race meetings to organize the controls of it. And into this vacuum in 1881 and 1882 was coming the English Amateur Athletic Association. Now, ordinarily, this would not have been necessarily a massive problem, except it was a problem here for two, for two, for, for several reasons. First of all, the English Amateur Athletic Association had in its rules that athletics events would take place on Saturdays and never on Sundays, which obviously was a problem for rural Ireland, where Sunday was the traditional day of leisure. Number two, English athletic events were predominantly they were given more to um, to running than to throwing events, and and I think this mattered in terms of the nature of the throwing events which were organised uh, across Ireland. And number three, there were issues around who actually could compete over these. Because in English 3A events, they were becoming increasingly elitist in the nature of who would be allowed to compete in events. And of course, the spectre of amateurism and professionalism began to, 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 to raise its head. Now, we shouldn't go down that particular rabbit hole today. I know we have to talk about money and sport in the coming weeks. We should just leave that 
yeah. for the moment. But the context matters here, and the context here is land and freedom in Ireland. You have 1879 to 1882, and onwards after 1882, a land war in which you get the beginning of a revolution of land ownership in which the people of Ireland have been renting land as tenant farmers to around 5,000 landlords over time, and you get the beginning of a land revolution, the introduction of law, which takes 30, 40, 50 years, but it eventually means the transfer of the ownership of the land of Ireland to people who actually farm that land rather than to landlords. So that's there in the background. Number two, the rise of the Irish Parliamentary Party under Charles Stuart Parnell, and the sense that for the first time since 1800, there is this sense that there can be a parliament in Dublin that there will be a home rule parliament, that it will not just be Ireland taking laws from Westminster and, uh, and sending representatives across. And all the while, the Irish Republican Brotherhood are there fermenting ideas around revolution. So those three things matter um, as, as ideas, uh, as our politi- kind of political and land, around politics and around nationality and around land. And behind that, again, there was a cultural revolution beginning to ferment. So you see, an organization founded in 1882 called Eintok Magoelga, which talked about um, re-establishing the Irish language as a spoken language across a broad swathe of country. In 1882, you get the idea that there should be an Irish industrial exhibition. So this isn't just, the idea was that the Irish, that the British controlled the world of industry. But we, this was an attempt by Irish nationalists to say, well, we can produce industrial goods as well. And they demonstrated them in Dublin, very close to where, to where Cusick lived. So you get this idea of, of, of a kind of a growing sense of Irishness in 1882. And that notion of the three A's, the Amateur Athletic Association from England pushing its rules across, grated on people who were looking for home rule in other aspects of their life. Okay. So that's the backdrop and the ethos then is relatively clear. I'm sure some had stronger IRB leanings towards others, but there's, there's a cultural aspect to this as well. They need to figure out what games they're going to play. Athletics, you've mentioned, and the significance of Irish athletics. Where is hurling at this stage? I mean, like we've talked before, and so it wasn't just invented, it was a thing. But as I understand it, it had largely disappeared in advance of 1884. Well, if you look at what was happening with hurling, well, first of all, we should say the GEA was founded. It was called the Gaelic Athletic Association for the Cultivation and Preservation of the National Pastimes, to give it its full title when it was established in, in, in 1884. And its primary focus through 1885 was athletics, was the staging of athletics competitions all around Ireland and pulling in athletic events into the organisation in standardising rules for running and jumping and throwing events and opening those events, holding them on Sundays, and opening them, as they said, to Irish people of every class. That was, it dominated the business of the GA for those years. But mm-hmm. two other sports were pulled in to the organization. So we'll talk about Gaelic football, if that's okay, for, 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 for a second. Gaelic yeah. football, the rules, first rules for Gaelic football, initially called Irish football, uh, were written by Morris Davin and published, or put before a meeting of the GA on the 17th of January, 1885 and published in the newspaper subsequently and then later in the early spring published in pamphlet form uh, and disseminated around the country. Now these were very loose, very vague rules and the reality of it was that it, they weren't massively different rules than rugby and soccer. You could see the similarities between these games. So why was it thrown in the mix? Well it was thrown in the mix as an idea by Morris Davin who hated rugby. He thought rugby was a demoralizing, denationalizing game. And it wasn't something that, was, was, uh, that, that it needed to be cleaned up. And he liked the old, grand old, as he called them, the grand old Irish kicking games. So that mattered. What also mattered is that in 1884, routinely, year after year, from 1874 onwards, Ireland had played England in rugby match and then in soccer matches and were getting tranced. Epic score lines, failing even to score most times they played. And there was the argument that, well, you know, maybe we need to change the rules a bit. Maybe when we play England, we should play 17 players and they play 13. And that will make it a, a more... You know, so this was set up as something that was a, a rival game to, 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 to rugby and uh, ultimately, I suppose, to soccer as well. 
So that's where Gaelic football comes from. Now, hurling is a really different story. And it's a really, it's a, it's a complicated enough story, except to say, so we'll, we'll run through this pretty quickly. But if you read official histories of the GEA, and if you, if you look at the museum, there's all, you get the sense that hurling had disappeared after the famine. That hurling was something that had been lost kind of in the wake of the spread of English games and the wake of emigration uh, and the number of people who had died. And there was basically a demoralization in society and that Michael Cusick had rode into the countryside here and, and basically um, salvaged a game that had been lost to history. Mm-hmm. And the reality is much more complex than that because hurling hadn't disappeared from a number of places. They hadn't disappeared in North Tipperary. If you read the Nina Gargin from the 1850s and the 1860s, you can see the number of hurling matches that are being played in those areas. If you look at East Galway, hurling is still being played there. In North Kerry, as late as 1882, you see entries in local landlords' books of hurling being played on the land. There are around Cork City, there are elements of hurling. There are little pockets of hurling in Leash and in Offley and Westmead. And then if you go up to the north, you see in both in West Donegal and in East Antrim, remnants of stick and ball games still being played on an annual basis called by different names, come on in, 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 in Donegal. Yeah. So this game had not disappeared. What it hadn't done is modernised. It's amazing. You're still plucking out parts of the country where you still very much associate with hurling, isn't it? This is exactly it. It's the geography of hurling. Is, 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 it is one of the great questions that must be asked of the GAA. If hurling is such a great game, why is it not played in more places around the country? Than, than that, and, and um, it is it is the question that is worth repeatedly, uh, w- repeatedly asking. Now we have to go back and look um, at the other aspects of hurling in the country because hurling was also played in Irish emigrant communities. There was a hurling league in Melbourne with a set of rules that was established in all of those areas, places like Collingwood, places that we consider now of Australian rules teams. They had a hurling league with a set of rules that was played through the late eighteen seventies in Boston. The Boston Hurling Cup was played in 1880, 1881, 82, 83, and into 1884 when there was a massive dispute for this gold cup in which made it to the Boston courts because a team which had won it three times in a row insisted on keeping this gold cup uh, and there was a round the courts over that. So that tells you that hurling was modernizing in those places. And there was an element of modernization of a type here because there was a Hurley, Hurley club active in Trinity College from 1870 onwards into the early 1880s. Now, if that is sometimes considered hurling and sometimes not, depending on what, on what your argument is. It has led some, somebody such as Edward Carson played on that team, the founding father of modern unionism in Ulster, and it has sometimes led to the statement that sure didn't Edward Carson play Fitzgibbon Cup hurling for Trinity, and the answer, of course, is that he didn't. He played a game in Trinity where they used hockey goals they could strike with one side of the stick only and they could be offside and they had looked as well to England for their rules. But this game of Hurley had spread out of Trinity College into schools such as the High School and King's Hospital and had spread into banks and prosperous suburbs of the south side of Dublin. Possibly 14, up to 14 teams at all who founded the Irish um, Hurley Union in 1879. Some of those players from that Hurley Union came together with Michael Cusick in late 1882 and founded the Dublin Hurling Club at the Royal College of Surgeons. And the idea was that they would make a game which combined what they called the science of hurling. They would bring back hurling, basically, to the city of Dublin. So hurling would be kind of, it would continue, but hurling was considered to be a distinctive game and it was played. It fell apart in mutual loathing. Cusick mm-hmm. thought that these guys were basically soft, softies and not really racy of the soil as he considered himself and accusing himself by return was deemed a savage so they didn't meet the club fell apart later in 1883 Cusick took the hurleys that had been made from that club and he went up to the Wellington Monument in the Phoenix Park on a Saturday afternoon in early October 1883 and he had with him three other people uh, the Mollahan brothers Pat and Tom from Clare and a guy called Elsie Slevin from Armagh and the four of them started to puck the ball around. And they met again the following Saturday, on the following Saturday. Cusick advertised it in the newspapers for which he was writing and in other newspapers, and people slowly began to join across those weeks. So week after week, there were enough people through. He changed 
and now he uses school to set up the Cusick's Academy Hurling Club. And then he founded the Metropolitan Hurling Club out of those people who were coming together on Saturday afternoons in the Phoenix Park. And it was, Cusick was later to write that it was out of these Metropolitan Hurlers that the game of hurling was, was, was and, they, and the Gaelic Athletic Association was formed. But it wasn't just from there. There's another element of the story which matters, which ties in the traditions of play across rural Ireland and Cusick modernisation of sport through the Metropolitan Hurling Club. And that happened on Easter Monday, 1884. Because the people who were in Galway had seen, in Colima in Galway, had seen what Michael Cusick had done in Dublin. And they'd written to Cusick and challenged them for a match on the Fair Green in Ballinasloe on Easter Monday, 1884. So Cusick named his team in the paper, took the train down to Dublin, was met at the train station on Easter Monday morning by uh, a whole lot of the hurlers in Colima. And they were marched down from the train station to the Fair Green behind the brass band and the two teams, 21 assigned, lined up in the middle of the field for the ball to be thrown in. The ball was thrown in between the hurlers of Kalimer and the metropolitan hurlers from Dublin, most of whom were country men living in the city. And the Kalimer men just, for, for the first few minutes, just, just, just took complete control. Drove the ball into, the, into Cusick's end of the field, scored a goal, and were running around the place celebrating. When Cusick just said, what, what are you doing? Like, what, 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 what game are you playing? This is not how you play hurling. And instructed the Kalimer men to leave the field so his team could give a demonstration of how hurling should be played amongst themselves. The Kalimer men then said after a few minutes, well, we don't really see the difference, so you stand aside and watch us play. So they went out and played. The, the upshot of it was Cusick understood immediately that his team were not on a winner here. So he did what any sensible manager would do and he took his team home. He took them straight off the pitch. They went back up to the train station and went back to Dublin in the train. Meanwhile, the Kalimer men went out on horse-drawn carriages out to Kalimer where bonfires blazed and they drank long into the night and had a gold cup. Now, this would matter. This matters for two reasons. It matters, obviously, because it's the old and the new coming together. But what happened after that were letters to the newspapers which said, this grand old game, we must, we must revive it. We cannot let this die. This is centuries. Of, of our tradition. We have to put this in with an organization and Cusick hit on this idea of pulling in hurling beside athletics into his establishment of, of the Gaelic Athletic Association. Wow. Amazing. So 1884, over the next, say, 15 years as we get into 20th century, does this thing explode and thrive? Is it all classes of society? Because, you know, even one of the great things about the GAA now is I don't associate it with any class of people. Uh, for instance, so so was that always the case? Did it catch on, or was this a slow burner? Oh, it caught on. It, it in Cusick's own words, it spread like a prairie fire uh, across the country. Now, within that statement, hides uh, a whole lot of hidden truths around places where it didn't catch on. And the GEA, you still needed a certain amount of disposable income to play sport. You still do, and you did even at that stage. And there are stories of clubs from Mead, for example, writing saying, look, we would love to join, but our main can't afford the subscription fee. So it's not just, and you need a certain amount of money to be able to travel. On the morning of the first ever All-Ireland Hurling Finals, seven of the Turles team were left on the platform because they did not get their expenses for earlier matches and there was around the camp. So this is uh, a really, it, it, allowing for that, the GEA was more democratic than other sporting organisations. It opened itself out much more successfully than others did. It created a broad base and crucially, it provided a day out. And this idea of a day out on a Sunday was essential to the spread of the organization. So it became a thing to go to matches, to march behind the band. The, old, the, the parade you now see in Crow Park, squeezed into a playing field, is a parade that used to take place through the towns. Players used to tog out in hotels or in pubs or wherever in the middle of a town, or they used to march from, tra march from train stations behind marching bands and that marching band that parade behind them was kind of like a colorful pied piper drawing people to the place where the game would be played and then they would play it in and you would often have multiple matches football and hurling matches played together athletics events on the sidelines hawkers selling their wares gamblers or gamble stations all along the side of the field even people selling drink at matches during those uh, early years so this is it became a huge day out for people across rural Ireland and also in urban Ireland where people came together and Dublin became a huge focal point 
for the association, um, for, for the playing of big matches and for the organisation of those games. In those early years, though, the GA did almost collapse in the early 1890s when there was a massive split in the organisation between radical Republicans who sought to take control of the organisation and others who saw it as a sporting organisation. Mm. And it almost pulled the association asunder. There was talk of it disbanding, and particularly in the wake of the Parnell split, which saw the Irish parliamentary pulled asunder after divorce proceedings around Parnell and Kitty O'Shea, Catherine O'Shea, mm. and the manner in which that destroyed uh, the Irish parliamentary party and left members of the GEA taking sides only three counties attended the annual convention in 1892. For example, very few teams were entering the All-Ireland Football and Hurling Championships. But broadly speaking, the story through the 1880s and the 1890s is the story of a modern sports organisation, essentially dating those British sports organisations that can, it can see around it in terms of its structure, in terms of the codification of games, the organisation of championships and of grounds, Im- imitating them but doing it in an Irish way. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, one last quick one. Uh, how quickly does the church get on board and we have bishops throwing the balls in and all this kind of stuff? Depends on the church. The church almost destroyed the GEA in 1887. There was a massive fight. Uh, the GEA's annual convention in 1887 was held in November in the Turles Courthouse and it ended up in a free fight between Republicans and churchmen. The churchmen... Um, it th- th- was really clever. They were Cusick and Davin really cleverly got Archbishop Croak, the most popular cleric, uh, on board at the beginning of the of the um, of the organisation. They, they took him in as patron, and Q- Croak wrote. Uh, he wrote a brilliant letter, which is still published. In it's an extraordinary letter. He is still published in the GA's official guide, which is in itself extraordinary uh, that it is still published there, where he talked about uh, foreign games being kind of effeminate, effeminate folly and that such games were played by degenerate dandies so it was and croak was croak was had this idea that you know you must go back to the sports of the irish so he was utterly in favor of what his of this idea of the ga but there were other bishops who hated the ga because they viewed sunday now as turning into sports and drinks Mm. and it was not something that they wished to see and they viewed it they did not want their parishioners also going over to to, to an organization which it saw in part uh, constructed around radical Republicans and a recruiting ground for such Republicans. Okay, okay. This is our Archbishop Croke, uh, presumably Croke Park, Archbishop Croke. This it? is Archbishop Croke. Croke, uh, Croke Park was, was uh, it's a 1913, um, it was called after him at that stage, but he's the first patron. The first four patrons of the GA were Parnell, uh, obviously the leader of, 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 um, of uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party. Um, Archbishop Thomas Croke is the leading and most popular Catholic cleric in the country. Uh, Michael Davitt as the leader of the Land League and later John O'Leary, who is the Irish Republican Brotherhood. So it was a real kind of, you know, this is the context you see in those, in their patronage, you see the context. And yes. this idea of having a patron, it's essentially imitating what mm. the British did. You see sports clubs established here. Who is the patron of the Enniscorthy Tennis Club? It's the Lord Lieutenant of Dublin, or Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, who is the British representative right. in the place. It's a, it's a natural, normal thing to do. Yeah, that's very, those patrons is a, is a very instructive Venn diagram of the various aspects of Irish life. And those bishops were right, because pretty soon people are going to Mass on a Saturday to get it out of the way for Sunday matches. I mean, they were onto something. They knew how it would go. Well, there was much, uh, Croke made much of the fact that people were that no GA man would miss mass on a Sunday before he can go play a match well they must have gone to mass very early yeah. if, uh, if, if, if they were not if they were going on for some matches Paul that's week six I presume invariably the GA will find its way into future conversations because it's just so seismic if we're talking about 20th century Irish sport well I think the place to go next um, and we have to talk about the GA in this as well is I think the next place we have to go to is money because there is money everywhere in this new sports revolution. And I think it's really interesting to see what happens to the GA, to soccer, to rugby, but also to other sports and industries. And this idea of amateurism and professionalism, what is amateurism? Where did it come from? Why are you amateur? Why are you not amateur? Why are you a professional? What is a professional? All of those things. We'll probably talk about that next week. And I think the week after that, we'll talk about 
we spoke hugely about men today. And if you go through the entirety of the minute books of the GA for most of its first hundred years, the only woman mentioned is Maud Gone, and that's for nationalist reasons. So you look at this is a man's world that was being constructed, but an alternative women's world of sport emerges as well. So we'll talk about that. Okay. And then I think the following week it'll be sport and war. Oh, great. Okay. Well, for now, Paul Rouse, professor at UCD School of History. Thanks, Paul.